Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for my webinar. I don't think it works. I think it worked. It's oh, from, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to share with you today during my webinar. And today I have Whitney Gold as my co-host and I'm super excited to have her. She is such an amazing caster. She's a very accomplished spay caster. Um, she's won Spayorama, I don't even know how many times. She's an amazing guide and has become a great friend of mine. So I'm super stoked to have her here with me today. And I'm gonna turn it over to her for just a minute. Go for it. Hi, Hi. Um, so today I'm introducing Audrey Wilson. Um, Audrey's presenting what's all the psych about me mental preparation for fly fishing success. Um, sorry, I mean, I've got some notes here, so I'm just gonna kind of refer to them. But, um, but before we launch into her bio, I would like to share why Audrey's been so inspiring to me. I met Audrey over a year and a half ago at the Wasatch Fly Fishing Show in Salt Lake City. I was teaching a two-hand fly casting class, and Audrey was uh, the assistant teaching for a women's fly fishing, beginning fly fishing class taught by Marianne Dozer and Molly Semnick. Um, this particular show also had a competition, a fly casting competition, where there was a very large cash prize. It was really <laughs> inspiring, and I was like, I want that. <laughs> so on a whim, I decided to, um, I, I entered. And you, this one, you have to you enter, and you have to qualify for the finals. And I did qualify. In fact, I qualified with the second highest women's score ever. And to be honest, that was luck. It was just dumb luck. I, I, I was amazed that I'd done it. Um, I was pretty psyched that I'd done it, but the next morning I woke up and I was like, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> I just knew it, you know, that gut feeling. And um, I knew I was in over my head. I had it prepared. I hadn't practice casting at all. Um, I wasn't mentally prepared. I wasn't, I was just freaked out. So that being said, of course, I finished with the lowest score ever, ever in the final, um, in the women's thing. So I went from second highest to the lowest, but the reality, it didn't, it was no surprise to me. I mean, and the honesty is I didn't care. The real for me, the takeaway was A, I had it in me to, to do well the first day. And B, um, I realized that with practice and some preparation that I could one day be out there with the bigs and the greats, people like Audrey Wilson, Molly Semnick, and Maxine McCormick. And uh, so Maxine and Audrey and I, and Audrey will talk about this more, I don't want to take this away, we're going to be part of Team USA together. And my goal is to stand up there in the podium with her and Maxine with a medal. What metal it is, I don't care, just one. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so to but Audrey. Audrey is a powerful, ambitious, kind person who also happens to have a killer loop. Um, she is the Utah program director for Casting for Recovery. She's also the only Fly Fishing Federation IF FFI, sorry guys, still haven't gotten that one down. <laughs> the FFI female certified casting instructor in Utah. Um, I would strongly encourage anybody who's interested in wanting to pursue a better cast or pursue competition casting or anything to contact Audrey. You will not be disappointed. Anyway, before, okay, so before I pass this back to Audrey, I have a quick thing. I'm using my cell phone for this. And it's hard for me to go back and forth between comments and Q&A. So I was hoping that everybody, if you had a question, if you could put it in Q&A, and that way I won't knock down the phone or do something silly and disrupt Audrey's most excellent presentation. Anyway, hope all is well. And you guys enjoy yourself. You're going to have a great show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Whitney. And like she said, feel free to ask any questions that you would like, and we will certainly get to those. So we're gonna just jump right into my presentation. Stand by. All right, so the topic, what's all the psych about? Mental preparation for fly fishing success. 
So my journey began first with fly fishing, but not long after that was my FFI journey. And then throughout that, I got involved in competition, which all led me to this mental management um, system that I follow for myself. And all of it's made me become a better fly fisher, competitor, instructor, and just involved in the community. So like I said, it first began um, as a fly fishing journey and then FFI casting instructor. And through all of that came a lot of growth and challenges along the way. And I think back to this time when I'm on the Green River, I'm new to the sport, and all I want to do is be like all the cool fly fisher gals and guys on the river and I'm with a, a guide friend and we're floating down a section of the green below Flaming Gorge Dam and I have all this line kind of piled up in front of me in front of the boat and I go to do a back cast so of course there's no tension on the line right and I got lucky that the fly went whizzing back past my head but my friend didn't get so lucky and luck would have it the big size eight hook fly hooks him in the cheek and there I am feeling so defeated and embarrassed and he's sitting there like what the heck just happened I don't know what to do I don't know whether to be mad or what and so there's just this silence and I'm sitting there in the front of the boat with my elbows and my knees and my hands on my face and I don't know what to do so luckily we were able to move past it and one of his friends on the river got the big old hook out of his cheek because unfortunately we forgot to debarb the hook so that made it more interesting but um, we worked through it and I didn't focus so much on the imperfections after that. So I overcame it and that same day later that day I catch this big cut bow, 26 inch on um, a big dry fly. He was sipping up on the water and I cast it out there and I landed this beautiful fish and I'm excited that my friend, my guide friend, experienced fly, um, fly fisher guide is just ecstatic, just jumping up and down, so excited. And I, I don't know what just happened. I'm like, what's the big deal? You know, I'm, I'm new to this and what's the big deal? But now I realize it was a pretty big deal. And um, I love to think back on that moment because I overcame that snafu earlier in the day and caught this beautiful fish. So back to my FFI journey that started not long after my fly fishing journey began. Um, I was at a sports and expo in Sandy, Utah. I wasn't there for anything related to fly fishing really. I was just there to walk, walk the show and I see this big old casting pond in the middle of the expo and see these amazing casters up on this po uh, podium competing and teaching. And I'm thinking, I want to do that. I used to play um, competitive sports growing up and those days are long gone and I have this new passion of fly fishing and I want to do that. And that was about 13 years ago, I believe. And so I'm doing that and the I'm just so motivated. I want to do this. So I get up the gumption. I walk up there and start asking some questions. And um, luckily, I started talking to Molly Semenik, which those that, have know, that know her, she's a super accomplished um, instructor, certified with FFI over many years. And I was so lucky to just, that started my journey with FFI and competing. She was instantly a new mentor of mine. She lined me up with an instructor that lived locally here in Utah. And I just got to learn so much and develop my casting, um, utilizing the resources and the mentors through FFI. So moving on, and throughout my journey, well, I don't love just to cast. My first love is absolutely fly fishing and it's completely enhanced my ability to fly fish. And here you can see me um, fishing up in Montana with a guide and just casting away and having a blast. So I definitely encourage those um, that don't even want to become a casting instructor, but still um, want to become a better caster. Uh, please utilize FFI and the resources online at the Learning Center. 
So like I said, I am a casting instructor certified with FFI. I'm the first woman in Utah to do it. So I'm super excited about that. And um, I certified in September of 2019. And over the years, I, I, I feel like I could have done it much sooner. But you know, life happens to us all. Things come up or we have self-doubt and we put it off. But last June, I decided, finally, I'm just going to do it. I've practiced. I know I can do this. So in June, I picked September to certify. And over those next few months, I just applied my time, applied my focus, worked with the mentors, used the resources at the website, went through the exam prep, and tested and certified and got it done. Hey, Audrey. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, there's a question. Um, so it was you answered, did you use a mentor? And if so, how did you find a mentor? So I, like I said, when I um, met Molly, it was actually at the Sportsman's, at a Sportsman's Expo. So I got super oh. lucky that way. But you can definitely find a, mem a mentor by going to FFI online for sure and find out who is locally and the world we live in today now, um, a lot of it's being done online now. So there's also that option too. So definitely check that out online. Nice, thank you. No problem. So um, here you see me teaching. So before I certified, I practiced my teaching as well and training and all the preparation before um, testing and certifying. So that's important. And then in September, 2019, I accomplished it and certified and feel like it's enhanced my fishing and teaching ability so much and when you're teaching that helps you also learn too to teach others and here you'll see um, Jeff Wagner and Jonathan Walter they're mentors of mine but um, were examiners at the time too in September so it's doable follow your dreams apply your focus take it from me and don't wait So like I said, I started competing um, over the years. I've competed all over the West, but um, some of my bigger accomplish accomplishments that I'll mention was last year, 2019, I won first place at the GoPro Games, the two fly extreme. That was super exciting. You can see me here in that picture. And then not long after that, um, last year, I decided to get involved with the American Casting Association and casted at the Nationals and took second behind Maxie McCormick, which you can also see in this picture here. And like Whitney mentioned, we formed the U.S. Women's Fly Casting Team, which I'm super excited about. We have goals to go to the worlds and compete together and medal, and I can't wait for that opportunity and to continue to train with them. So one of the most important things that FFI and my fly fishing journey is just the people that it's brought to my life over the years that I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, the community is tight and such great people and that's the biggest thing that it's brought to my life is getting involved. So there's a question. Um, sure. They want to know, do you use the same rod and set up fishing that you do competing? Well, it depends on the competition because some um, competitions you don't have a choice in the rod and reel and line that you use. And then other ones you do have a choice. So the answer to that is yes, definitely sometimes I use the same rod that I fish and compete with because um, if I love to cast with it, then I love to fish with it too. <laughs> oh. So like I said, um, my fly fishing journey has brought me to um, also volunteering with Casting for Recovery. And you can see at the top picture here is some volunteers that I used to work with or still work with. And below you can see Casting for Recovery participants with their guides just getting ready to hit the river. So the community that it's brought me to um, is incredibly important in my life. So with that, that's led me to my, all of that has led me to this mental management system that I've put together for myself, um, for preparing for success for a variety of situations. So you can see in this picture, yes, that's me in Southern Utah repelling for the first time. Um, that's great. 
Uh, yeah, that's that just scary. I don't know. <laughs> it sure blows me away. It was scary. It was scary. I haven't done it again. Not to say I wouldn't. Um, it was pretty exhilarating. But I will say that I did not use this mental management system at the time, and I think it would have helped me because I was a nervous wreck <laughs> when I did it. But um, totally worth it. Super fun. So we'll go into this system. I um, developed three steps to consider. So the first step, self-image. Do I believe I can make that cast to that fish? Am I telling myself I can do this? Or what types of things am I telling myself? The important thing is it cannot be negative. It cannot be negative because you're reinforcing those negative thoughts in your brain and you won't have the confidence to um, achieve what you want to achieve. So always positive reinforcement, not negative. Tell yourself, I can do it. And honest, honestly believe that you really can. None of this, oh, I could. It's more, I will, and I, I'm going to do it. And do whatever it takes. Put post-it notes around your house or whatever with positive things, positive reminders, just to build up your self-image so that when you go into these kinds of situations of fishing or competing or whatever it is, um, you already have that positive self-image built up and you're not trying to build it up in the moment. That's really good. I have a, I have a question okay. so for you. Would you like it after the slide or? Go for it. It's, it's, okay, so there, there, somebody's just asked, what kind of competition? Is it distance and accuracy or is it both? And they want to know keys to distance and keys to accuracy. So, like, I think they just want a few tips as to okay. so, maybe. Um, some of the competitions are just accuracy and some of them are combined with accuracy and distance or there's ones that are just distance. So I think the most important thing to remember, and you can look this, this stuff up on the, um, in the Learning Center, but my tip to you is um, the, the key elements to your CAS in accuracy most certainly apply to your distance CAS. So if you're trying to CAS for a line, those elements um, of having good stops and good pauses for the line that you have out uh, become even more critical when you're casting a lot of line. I hope that answers the question. If it doesn't, let me know. <laughs> I thought that was really good. Okay, great. So the second step um, is all about your subconscious mind. Have I done what it takes to equip myself with the ability to make that cast to that big fish? So when you're thinking about my, your next fishing trip, think about you know the cast that you might have to take or if you're competing or whatever it is that you're doing, what kind of steps are you gonna to have to do to prepare yourself and repeat them? It's all about repetition so that you're training your mind and you're not overthinking it when it comes to that day when you gotta do it or in that moment. Because we all have that time when we're on the river and we see this big sipping fish and we're about to jump out of our waders and we have to pull ourselves together so that we can make that cast. So if we're doubting ourselves and we haven't trained ourselves with repetition, then it's going to be so much harder when it comes to that moment. So my tip is take mental notes, but I also like to take journal notes of the things I'm doing right. So what I mean is when you're out there casting or fishing or whatever, and you make a cast and you're like, oh man, that cast felt so good. Take the time to take a mental note or jot a note down on why it was good. Because we have this tendency to move on so quickly from those good casts. Because when we make a bad cast, we dwell on it for so long. And we got you have to change that. Because if you dwell on the bad stuff, that's what you're going to cement in your brain and you're going to repeat it. So train yourself to focus on those positive things and only write down what you do right, never what you do wrong. So that leads me to my conscious mind step, the third step. This is all about the process, all about when you're out on that river and you got to make that one cast, you have one chance because it's on such calm water and if you slap the water once and the fish is gone kind of moment, we've all had those. So um, when I say conscious mind, 
there's simple steps you can do because your conscious mind can only think about one simple thing at a time. You can't think about a ton of different things. So if you're in the moment trying to build up your self-image in the moment and think about all the details that you have to do to get your cast to where you want it to go, odds are against you. So prepare yourself for those moments. And then in the moment, just have a few simple steps. So for me, when I'm fishing or I'm going into a competition, I think about, okay, where do I got to stand? What does my stance look like? What is my equipment going to be? What it, does it look good? Is it all together? Um, how does my grip look? And do I have my line in my hand? And then I just tell myself to hit that target. And I've trained myself. I have the confidence to do it and the ability to do it because of training and practice that I can hit the target. So what's important to, and that is, is you're not overthinking it. And I'm not going to hit every target. It also helps you move on to the next target without fretting about the one you just missed. You can just go to the next to the next. And when we're thinking about fishing, like you see in this picture, if you move on, then you can catch more fish or catch that next, next fish and it doesn't ruin your day. <laughs> So this photo, I am going to show you a video actually of this moment in action and it kind of brings it all together because I'm up on this bridge casting across this water at targets. There's all kinds of sound. There's all these people watching me. And to add to that, I have a pro um, hockey athlete that is going to challenge me for like a for fun competition before the actual real competition. So I have to do this before I actually go compete. So there's all this pressure and I have to cast my line through that ring across the water into that tiny vertical hole of a target. So I have to hit as many targets within a time limit and then I have to hit the bonus target across the way into that tiny target within a certain time limit. So you'll see in the video, I hit a bunch of targets and then I decide I'm just gonna go after the bonus target. So stand by and I'll show you that. Here we go. today it makes my heart race a little bit but I would not have been able to do it without having a positive self-image and having all this practice that I've done and the repetition that I've done to be able to make a cast like that across the water like that under that kind of pressure so that kind of brings it all together um, in summary I told you about my fly fishing journey um, and how that led me to my casting instructor journey and wanting to become a certified casting instructor with um, FFI and all that leading to this mental management system that I trained myself to follow for any type of um, thing that I want to do, whether it's competing or for a fishing day or whatever it is. So I hope that you all picked up some tips from my system. Is there any, um, Oh, one more slide. So on the left of the slide, you can contact me here. And also I started a new website at First Fly that you can check out. 
And I do not want to forget to mention that Whitney Gold will be on on June 25th. So be sure to check out her webinar. She will be amazing. And then also we should see Jonathan Walter later this month too. Yay. Yeah. Hey, so I think there are some <laughs> questions for you. Cool. Um, and there is a question. Somebody asked, how often do you practice? I practice two to three times a week. And since all of this COVID stuff is happening, I've had more time at home because I get to telework that I can take breaks and go casting. So I've been doing more of it now, actually. But uh, at least two to three times a week. And if you really want to be exceptional at your goal, then you have to do at least that. Yeah, that's cool. And then somebody's asked you to go ahead and review the three steps of your system. Sure. So there's the self-image, and then there's the subconscious mind, and there's your conscious mind. So your self-image your self -image is all about daily things that build up your self-image, believing in yourself, being confident that you can do it, no self-doubt. Do not ever um, give negative, think negative thoughts. It's always positive reinforcement. And then your subconscious is all about that, that training that we just talked about, the two to three times a week or whatever it is, or um, preparing for a fishing day that you're about to go out on. Practice those skills before the day. Don't wait just before the day or the odds are against you. And then your conscious mind is just doing it. Simple steps. I see the fish, I need to stand here, my rod's good, my line's good, my line's out, cast to that fish, and you got it. <laughs> cool, somebody's asked, what size rod would you use for accuracy versus the size of rod you'd use for distance, and are they the same rods? Um, so, for competition, um, it's usually at five weight games, it's pretty common. But um, when we're talking ACA type stuff, you use um, heavier rods sometimes, never below five weight. So between five and nine weight, because if you're, of course, there's, you can generate more power with a, a heavier rod. So, um, but depending on the rules, of course, with the competitions is um, when you're able to select the rod, if that makes sense. Well, so somebody's asked, um, can you hear me when I'm reading like this? Yeah. How long, how, how long do your practice sessions usually last? Um, not usually more than an hour because then you start getting tired and you start making mistakes. So if you're tired, you're making mistakes, that's not positive reinforcement, right? That's not um, practicing the things that you're doing right. And I can't make those journal notes about casts that I'm doing well and why I'm doing well. So I, I keep them less than an hour because I don't want to tire out. Okay, and then somebody's asked, um, Aji, what would be a typical practice routine for you and for an intermediate level caster, me, what would you propose? For intermediate caster, well, if you're intermediate caster, I'm going to assume you can do a pretty good pick up and lay down type cast. So what I would do as an intermediate, and I even do this today, is when you're out casting, make sure you're doing all those um, elements that are important to great casting. So you have solid um, stops and pauses. Um, you have a straight line path. You don't have a huge arc and you're watching your loop. So it's all about perfecting your loop, right? When it comes down to it. So watching your loop. And then um, if you're, if you have a good pickup lay down um, with 30 feet line out, then progress forward to longer line. But don't, don't t try to force it. Don't try to do more than you're ready for. Is my biggest tip because those basic things are what, are critical as you advance. And um, as Audrey was pointing out, Molly Semnick did her, uh, her, uh, her, what is it? Webinar. Her webinar, yeah. Thing. yeah. Um, so, and you can find that at, if you go to the FFI and you click down to learning where it's in there. 
Yeah, um, her saved when is in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So you have another question. Um, oh, when you practice, what size line do you tie on the leader headed to the park in a few work? Also, map preparation is so key. That was awesome. Thanks, Tricia. Um, what size line do you tie on the leader? Oh, I get it. What le what size leader are you using when you practice? Oh, so for competing. And then, and then what are you adding to it to extend it out? Yeah, what tip okay. is? Well, it depends on the competition. So um, if I'm able to use a heavier weight leader, then I'm going to use it because I'm not going to worry so much about um, getting it to roll over. So if it's a 0x or 1x, it's going to be pretty easy to roll over. I'm not worrying about how it's going to slap on the water kind of thing. So it just depends on how I want it to present that fly. Does it need to stay on top of the water and land softly or can I just roll it over really quick? Cool. And then um, I had a question and I had it memorized and I forgot. Oh, um, <laughs> Oh, it says, oh, Molly had a point, which is the webinar schedule has a link to the past recorded webinar, so you can go find those. And then somebody's asked, um, how do you ensure you're not just practicing bad habits? That's a great one. I do that all the time. Reinforce well, that bad habit. Right. <laughs> well, the most and the best thing is to have somebody that knows what they're doing watch you so they, they can tell you what you're doing wrong. Um, the next best thing is videoing yourself. Get a cheap tripod and put your phone on it and just record yourself. There's really cool apps out there like Huddle um, where you can put it in slow-mo and then you can have somebody look at it or you can compare it to good casters and just work on changing how you're casting when you're comparing the two. That's my tip for that for sure. Um, cool. Uh, that's any more questions, anybody? Um, we good? Uh, yeah, we got, those are a lot of questions. That's awesome. Oh, Dutch. He, there is a, a comment here, I think. I'm sorry. Um, we got some comments. She says, Dutch uh, says, excellent presentation. And he's thanking you. Oh, thank you. And uh, Mike is saying that was awesome. And then somebody wrote, great program, so honest, loved it. Yeah, it was very, love it. Thank you. Oh, wait, you might have another question here. Another question, okay. <laughs> oh, wait, how far do you cast a five weight in competition? Wow. Distance? <laughs> that five weight in distance? I've seen you cast it up to like 90 feet. <laughs> so my, my longest recorded cast, I will say, is 93 feet. I've casted it um, 100 feet, but um, other casters um, can cast it over 100 feet, well over 100 feet. Um, so my goal is to um, breach the 100, <laughs> but that's where I'm at in my distance um, ability with a five weight. Cool. That's good. Um, cool. Are you working on footwork? Oops. What? That squirrel just happened. <laughs> okay. you You're funny. Is that it? <laughs> that was my question. How do you work on your footwork? <laughs> oh, right. Well, I do a dance routine first, and then no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> More questions. Um, from your perspective, what is the most important feature of the cast? Well, the most important feature is definitely the loop that the cast creates. So if you have a tight loop, you're going to be able to cast more accurately. You're going to be able to cast through the wind that's at your face, or um, it's going to have you know, great line speed. So watching your loop is going to be a good indicator of your cast being a good cast. Okay, and then there's a question. How often do you cast over 70 feet? How do you get over that? You get over 70 feet. I think over 70 feet. Okay, so the common mistake I see is the 
forward stop and your forward cast when you're coming forward isn't abruptive enough. So you have your back stop and your forward stop. A lot of people have this tendency to do this where they reach out thinking your muscle from your arm is somehow going to carry that energy created from the bend in the rod that is then transfers to the line in the stop um, is going to happen. It's not going to happen unless you have really good stops in your back and your forward cast. And also make sure that you let the line unroll completely behind you so that you generate enough power in the bend of your rod before you come forward to your stop in the front. That's going to be your biggest tip, I think. Cool. And then we've got lots more questions. So you're not going anywhere. <laughs> How big are your loops when casting 90 feet with a five weight? Hopefully tight. 90 feet with a five weight. Well, I haven't exactly measured it, but it's um it's probably around four or five feet. So when I'm when I think about FFI and what I learned through FFI becoming a casting instructor is um, keeping your loop within four feet, four feet or less. When you're making longer casts, your loop's gonna be um, likely a little bit bigger, but not too much bigger. So the goal is to keep it around four feet for sure. Cool, and then somebody's asked, what do you do to balance the physical challenges of casting yoga, stretching, a beer? So, yeah. um, being active is definitely important just to have that stamina. I think any kind of aerobic activity, but also you're going to create strength in your arm through practice. So when I'm practicing, like I said, if I practice more than an hour, then I get kind of tired. And when you're out fishing, lots of times you're out there for more than an hour, right? So um, just make sure you have a relaxed cast, that you're not forcing things. You're letting the rod do the work. You have good stops and you're not death gripping the the cork on the rod so, you're not, so you don't tire out so fast. And then somebody's asked, um, open stance. So when, oh, lost it. It's coming back. Um, oh, talking about footwork, uh, do you prefer an open or closed stance and why? So for, if I'm casting um, short distances and accuracy, it's more just a comfortable shoulder width stance and I'm, I'm right-handed, so my left foot is, um, or my right foot's forward just a bit, and my back foot's just back just a bit, but more, just comfortable. That way, um, you're not feeling awkward. But when I'm doing distance casts, then I open up my stance more. And if I'm doing really long casts, then I actually put my right foot back so that I can have more, um, lengthen my cast and my casting stroke so that I can carry it back here further and forward here. I'm able to rock back and forth more and use more energy from my body that way. That's cool. And then um, uh, for accuracy, which, uh, no, you answered that. Um, what's your advice for wind casting and accuracy? Wind casting and accuracy. So depending on the direction of the wind, so say it's at your face, um, you're gonna change the trajectory of your cast. So you're gonna cast more downward in your forward so that it kind of goes under the wind and more up in your back. So, and you're not gonna apply as much energy in the back because the wind's kind of helping you carry it back, right? And then just a little bit more energy or acceleration in your forward cast. If you have side wind, say it's blowing on my strong arm this way and the line keeps hitting me, um, what you can do is um, cast over your opposite shoulder. So you're not changing your cast much, you're just simply bringing the rod tip over to your left side so that when you're casting, the line is staying away from you because the wind's blowing it that way. And then somebody has asked, um, uh, oh, uh, where I lost it. Um, oh, what adjustments do you have to make for a fiberglass rod? So, fiber, so fiberglass are generally softer. And what that means is it takes um, a longer, it, it can bend more. So 
you have to wait longer. Um, but the positive thing about um, it being soft is you can actually feel the flex in the rod and that load or the energy being created in the bend of it more. So that when you say you do a, a back cast to a stop, you can feel the, the rod bending more, but um, you do have to be patient. I love casting with my fiberglass. Um, it, it actually, I believe, um, helps you become a better caster because it helps you slow things down and really think about um, what I need to do in a good cast. Right. Um, and then, choo, 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 choo. Uh, I gotta stop singing. What do you do to get, oh, this is a great one. You know, when you're in a funk on the river mentally, what do you do to get out of that funk? So, um, it's all about the self-image part. Um, we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. And just think, I, I can do this. I believe I can do this. Um, I messed up because of whatever reason, but I'm not going to focus on it. So I guess my biggest tip is, is don't focus on it so much. Focus on what you've done that's positive and just move on. Cool. And then um, somebody's asked, Jim's asked, what's your biggest, uh, biggest challenge in the FFI certification, certification test? Biggest challenge? Um, I would say myself <laughs> because um, there's lot, all this worry that gets created that it's not doable, it's so hard, it's going to take so much time. And I learned after doing the test that, um, yeah, I needed to do the work. Yes, I needed to work with mentors, but was it doable? Absolutely. So um, just get rid of that self-doubt and if you want it, um, prioritize it and just do it. Um, so there's two questions. I'm going to put them together. One is in, comp in accuracy competition, can you haul? And the second question, do you ever use furled leaders? I don't even know what a furled leader is. If so, when and why? I heard of a furled leader, but it's not coming to mind right now. Um, what was the first part of the question again? Sorry. Oh, uh, well, it's two different people asking two different questions. Oh, okay. uh, in accuracy competition, can you haul? Yeah, um, hauling becomes more important when you have more line out. So say I'm casting 60 feet, um, sometimes just a tiny little haul can help me generate more line speed to get it out there and be more accurate. Um, otherwise, um, if it's less line, um, you don't always need a haul. So I would say only use a haul when you need it. Okay, and um, Bruce Richards says, I love your statement of that conscious mind is all about the process of doing. It's a really good statement. When you are, and he's asking a question, when you're casting at targets, do you have a specific thought? Well, I'm thinking I just, I have to hit that target because I've prepared myself to do that and I'm not overthinking it. So I'm thinking I've got to hit the very middle. I aim for the very middle because that leaves the least amount of room for error because I'm, if I'm looking at the whole target as a whole, then I, there's more um, likelihood that I could miss it. So it's staring down that middle part of that ring. It brings us to one of our team chants. I can, I will, I must. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so also, uh, the next one is, um, Oh, somebody wants to know if your video that you did of the is on YouTube. The uh the the um I, the, but I could post it. I'll definitely I'll post it on my Facebook and my Instagram. So if you wanna go um to Audrey Wilson on my Facebook page or Audrey Fly Gal number one, um you can find it there too. I'll post it. Okay. Yeah, it's a um, it's a really cool video. It's, it's yeah. So and then you can uh, email Black, it to me. Yeah, Jim Black says thank you. He really enjoyed it. Cool. Yeah, I think he's got to go. And um, oh, somebody's asking, um, do you feel pressure perceived or real to be perfect when going for your certification because you are female? Pressure from others, not just from yourself. Are you feeling, are you feeling pressures from others because you're female, I guess is. 
yeah. No, um, it's always just been a goal of my own. Nobody else has um, pressured me or I've never felt that. And the community of people with FFI are super supportive. They've been supportive the entire time. And I believe they have a great pro process for examining and it's, you know, a lot of trust there. So no, my answer is no. <laughs> okay, I keep on shutting Zoom out, sorry. Um, uh, Casey Robin says, wonderful, I'm lovely, honest, thank you. No problem, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions, anybody out there? Anybody? Oh, wait, how long has the young lady McCormick become? Oh, how has Maxine become so successful? She started when she was like eight. And what does she do to grade? Well, she started very young and she's practiced a lot and she has learned the, the best skills for casting at a very young age and has just practiced them since she was really young. So that's what she I- She had a good, she's been coaching with also Chris Korch too. So. Yeah, she has a great coach, Chris Korch. who's an amazing and knowledgeable caster and coach. So she's had a lot of practice, a lot of support along the way. And she also, herself has a great attitude and I think that's helped uh, her along the way too. Yeah, her attitude just rocks. Yes. <laughs> this is so cute. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, do, you, uh, do you use a practice rod or a normal rod? Um, so a practice rod I'll use um, when I'm teaching. So you can buy practice rods that have the yarn on them or there's ones that actually have fly line on them. but um, you can use them indoors and people can also just use them to practice inside. But, um, but when I'm teaching outside, I don't use them too often. Um, I like to use the real deal most of the time. Cool. Okay. Um, we'll wait a few seconds and see if anybody else has any more questions. Wait, maybe they do. Did I miss one? Um, Nope, didn't miss one. All right. Continue. Well, thanks everyone for those of you that are still on and connected. I really appreciate your time and it was super fun. And thank you yeah. for being No, thank you. That was fun. Super fun. So I sat still. <laughs> Take care everyone. Thank you. Yep, thank you.